Hello, everybody, and welcome to our SWC Spotlight webinar. This is the one that we wait for all semester long because it is our Canvas course showcase. So we are going to be taking a look into a couple of colleagues' classes to see how they're using Canvas with their students. So today we have Michaela Vargas, Summer Mead, and Chris Hayashi with us. And we are going to be um, taking a look at uh, a great variety of different um, tools and ways of teaching in Canvas. First up is English instructor Michaela Vargas, who is going to share with you one of the most humanizing instructor videos I think I have ever seen. You're going to love this. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me all right. Last summer, I decided that I would make a welcome video for my students. Um, I spent about a week filming various places where I was spending my summer vacation. And then I created this welcome video to share in my discussion group. Um, I was inspired by the deft line training course I took last spring. Uh, I really love that course. You know, I've been teaching online since 2003, um, the dark ages of online teaching. And I thought I knew a bunch of stuff, but the deft training really got me excited again. Um, refreshed my energy and it was great. Um, so I spent last summer creating a, a brand new course in, in Canvas uh, using new sources, new books, new everything because I just wanted everything to be nice and new and clean. And um, so at the end of the summer, I thought I really need to do some video and I thought I'll make a welcome video for my students. And so I, it didn't really take as long as it, you might think. Um, Tracy's going to show you part of it. I think it's about five minutes long. Um, I made it over a week while I was on vacation. And I, my goals were to motivate my students to get excited about the course, um, to share a little bit about myself, because as you know, when you teach online, um, you, there's a huge distance and it's hard to really get to know the students. So I thought if I start at the very beginning, opening um, up my life and my world and my vacation to my students that they'll, they'll feel um, like, you know, we're getting to know each other and I'm not just another uh, computer that they're, they're coordinating with. Um, so I did that and I also tried to have fun and, and try to be a role model for my students like I always do um, to show them that it's important to give it your best in everything you do. So that's sort of the theme of the video. So I think that's a good enough introduction. If you want to share the video, Tracy, you can go ahead. Okay, so poof, here we are in Michaela's class, and you'll notice that we're in a discussion area. So uh, she has her discussion introduction here, and then the first person to post in her discussion is her. So um, this, this video appears oh. um, in her discussion. We're actually going to view it full screen, but if we were to look below this, we would see um, all of the students who responded to her video because now um, she's, she's not just the instructor, she's a real person who's in the class with them. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit after the video. Oh, hello. It looks like summer's winding down. I think it's time for me to tell you what's in store for you this fall. First of all, my name is Michaela Vargas. I've been teaching college English for about 19 years. For the last 10 years, I've been focusing on online teaching, which I really, really enjoy. I'm always surprised every semester about the connections and meaningful interactions I have with my online students. So hopefully this will be another wonderful, productive semester. In case you're wondering how I spent my summer vacation, I thought I'd make a little video to give you a glimpse into my life. Maybe the observant student might guess where this was filmed. Anyway, whenever I had downtime, my favorite thing to do was read a book, but I also had a lot of other hobbies this summer. It's time to tell you a little bit about the course. Some of you may not be totally stoked about signing up for an English composition course, but my goal is to change your mind over the next 16 weeks. Now, of course, we're gonna be focusing on writing, research, all the things you need for academic success, 
but you'll also hopefully find that the readings we're going to do are full of interesting ideas and philosophies. I'm available online every day. I promise to respond to your emails within 24 hours, but usually a lot sooner. I really love getting to know my students, so please don't be shy and reach out to me. Also, on Mondays, I have live chat office hours. So if you need a question answered right away, send me a chat ping on Gmail. Have you ever wondered what the meaning of life is? Or what we're here for and why should we be happy? Well, I don't promise to answer those questions, but we've got a lot of exciting, interesting readings in which we'll delve into topics just like this. Some of you may be old pros at online learning, and some of you may be new. I have a few tips. First of all, make a schedule and stick to it. We don't have any live meetings in this class, so you can do your work at lunch, in the middle of the night, while you're at work, while you're waiting outside for your kids. Anytime that you can get connected to the internet or read your textbook, you can do it. But I recommend all of you make a schedule. Figure out which days of the week and what time of the day you're going to do your work. Because otherwise it's easy to get lost and fall behind. Remember, it's really important to engage in the course this semester. You're online, but doesn't mean you're not alive. Be sure to put all your energy into each discussion post. You're not just talking to computers, you're talking to real humans that want to hear what you have to say. The more energy and effort you put into this course, the more you'll get out of it. Remember, you're paying for this course, you bought the books, you're taking time off to do your studies, so you might as well get the most out of your money, right? I hope that you enjoyed the course, but also that you put in all your energy, enthusiasm, and time. Alright, and it's my goal that none of you feel isolated during the online experience. So whenever you need help, just ask for it. Email me, use your fellow students, and don't forget the wonderful Canvas resources. Alright, it's time to dive in. Wow, people are giving this video tons of kudos in our chat. So, Michaela, can you tell us a little bit about how your students responded to this? Students were real positive. Um, don't get me wrong, the video didn't like change our course and make it this most amazing, brilliant course. It kind of, the buzz died down after a few days and then the video was done and nobody watched it. But for me, it set a tone. Um, a couple of students made comments like, this video gives me the warm fuzzies and thanks for the warm welcome. So. They, I think it gave a tone of, of um, welcome, warm feelings. Um, a couple of students commented that motivated them to put more effort before they wrote their introduction. So it set the bar high for really putting some effort into your introduction. Um, a couple of them said, it seems like you really love what you do teaching and learning. So that was nice that they got that. Um, my best comment was, but let's be honest, the real star of the show was that amazing Pomeranian. So yeah, my dog kind of stole the show. <laughs> but yeah, generally, they're good. Uh, in another course that I, that I taught after the, I showed the welcome video, um, about 10 weeks later, students had to create their own video. They had to write and perform a speech. Um, so a couple of them said um, they're really nervous, but they were motivated by my video. So it, it was it wasn't like a huge deal for the course, but I think it just created a tone that was helpful throughout the semester. When they see that you have a pet, and especially your dog who's just bounding in and bounding out, um, and then you're talking without any interruption, it just really shows, like you said, what kind of person you are. Um, and your students see how much time you put into this, and then they feel like they're in really good hands because you obviously care about this class, yeah. and you're obviously present even, even during the summer, you're still present in the class. Yeah. yeah. And then I, it, it's interesting what you said about how that gave them the, the, the courage to make their own videos because your video was not um, formal, right? And it was fine if you took video with, you know, your diving mask on or popping out of the pool because what you wanted to do was connect with your students. And I think that really frees people from the nervousness that comes with making videos sometimes. Right. Yeah. So uh, somebody wants to know, how did you get the shot of the beach? Oh, my husband has 
has a drone he's been playing with. So after he videoed me speaking, he cut and he sent his drone up to film me. It's like his hobby. So yeah, that was pretty lucky that I have him on my side. <laughs> <laughs> As for closed captioning, it was very easy. I just sent a link to Darlene Poisson at Disabled Student Services. She sent me back the closed caption link um, built into YouTube. It was very easy and very cool. So, yeah. so um, I know that uh, if you're like me, you're going to want to watch this video a couple of times and think about how you could do some of this in your class and, you know, see if Michaela's husband wants to bring his drone out to help make your video. <laughs> yeah, he did. yeah, and I decided I'm going to do the same thing over winter break and make a, a winter welcome for everybody. And then I'll probably use those over the next few years, so I'll have to make a video every semester. So that's, I'm sketching out my ideas for the winter. <laughs> Yeah, you were smart to not mention the year or any right, other. Right, yes. <laughs> oh, well, that, that is probably my favorite video of this entire year. I, I just don't think anything that I've seen can top that. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. You might have noticed that in Michaela's class, she was using groups. So we saw a discussion and it was for group two. And so Summer also uses groups. In fact, she's probably our Canvas groups guru. Um, I think she's been using them longer than anybody else on our campus. And so she's going to share with us um, how that works, how she does it. And um, she's going to be really showing you what it looks like in the Canvas course. So you, once we're done here, you should be able to do this for your classes too, if you'd like to. So take it away, Summer. Hi everyone, I'm Summer. I am gonna take my video off. I'm at my day job and there's a lot going on around me right now. So, um, so you're not watching people walk behind me. I am gonna turn off my video, but I wanted to say hi and show you I'm here. Um, so I teach sociology. I've been at Southwestern um, for almost 10 years now and I've been teaching online almost that entire time. Um, I typically teach eight week classes um, and have 35 to 45 students, um, and I, I basically found that my discussions um, were just unmanageable. I was spending, you know, 10 hours a week minimum going through and making sure that I was making contact with each student, um, and so I was really trying to figure out a way to make it more manageable um, and decided to try out some group discussions, and that was back in my Blackboard days. Um, and so um, what I do is I assign students randomly to groups. Canvas makes it super simple to do this um, in just a matter of seconds. Um, I put them in groups for the first four weeks of our eight-week class, and then I uh, reassign them to new groups in the second four weeks of our eight-week class, so that way they um, have the opportunity to you know, intermingle with, um, with other students and get to know each other. Um, and really my goal is always looking at the regular effective contact because I feel like discussions are one of the best ways for us to do this. Um, not to mention, of course, establishing a really strong rapport with them and helping them kind of grow their, their knowledge and understanding of the subject matter. Um, so I found that when I was doing these really large discussions that um, students were kind of too anonymous, right? There'd be a lot of discussion in, in one forum uh, or in one thread and not enough in the other. Um, and so this has certainly helped in that way. And I found that um, people are participating more. Um, I'm seeing a lot more effort going into posts um, and the groups themselves have had um, a lot stronger identity. Sometimes I'll even, uh, depending on the semester in the class, I'll even ask them to come up with a, um, a group name and a group motto and that kind of stuff. So I'll show you some of the features in Canvas for groups um, that go beyond the discussions. So I sign on that first day. Um, I have them tell everybody what their uh, group is and their introductions. And so the, the bonds kind of start immediately in that first assignment. Um, this screen shows you what, um, what I see when I'm in Canvas looking at my group discussions. One of the things that I really like is um, that you can't mess it up um, and the students aren't going to just show up in 
um, in a group that they're not supposed to be. I was having that a lot in Blackboard. I was assigning students to groups, but then I would find them participating either in all of the group discussions or the wrong one. And I was having to do a lot of um, reaching out and, and trying to make sure they understand where they're to be participating. And so I don't have that problem here. Um, as the instructor, when I look at the screen, I have all six of the discussion groups that I've created. Um, and on that right hand side, you have your numbers and that kind of tells you how many posts there are in any given group on the right hand side and then in blue, um, those would be the ones that I haven't viewed yet. Uh, and so it's kind of a nice way I check in on my class multiple times a day to know when um, I need to go in and, and check on a discussion. It also indicates to me when there's not a lot going on. Um, so I can pop into just one group and say, hey guys, you know, I expect you to, to ramp it up. Um, or if there's a lot going on, it tells me that there's something controversial happening and I should get to it immediately. <laughs> so um, my group discussions all revolve around some kind of um, quote that is relevant to our topic for the week and then some fairly focused questions. And I require that students um, post to uh, a response to this original um, post and then they have to respond to two of their fellow students. Uh, those responses have to include questions that um, keep the critical thinking going and then they also have to come back and follow up on whatever questions are posted in there. Um, so this is what it looks like for me. This is what it would look like for the student. And I kind of cut the screen a little bit short, but they have the full assignment that's appearing here. Um, when they go into the discussion though, you can see where I have it redlined. Here are the ones you have access to. Underneath that, it's just going to have um, the one group that the student has been assigned to. And I suppose if you assign them to multiple groups, um, then that would appear there too. But uh, I assign my students to just one group and, and then they, just click on that and it takes them straight into their group discussion. Um, so it's really, like I said, foolproof. Uh, the actual discussion itself functions exactly the same um, as non-grouped discussions in Canvas. We have uh, each student's um, thread posted uh, underneath the assignment and uh, you can kind of see here with the arrow, again, which threads have more comments than others. And so it allows me to really focus my efforts each week. You know, if there's one post that's not getting a lot of attention, I can go in there and really, um, you know, try and, and make a big impact there. Uh, or if it's blowing up, then I've got something I've got to, <laughs> got to deal with. Um, and then I always go in and I post more thoughtful questions to keep the discussion going. But this, this part just displays and functions um, like all other just discussions in Canvas, um, which is nice because it's easy to see. Um, it allows you to isolate things a little bit. Um, and it also helps me in keeping it grouped um, in making sure that I am making that regular and effective contact with each of my students um, in multiple ways in those discussions each week. Um, there is some additional features that come with the group function beyond just the discussion. So when you're assigning students to a group, um, it gives them like their own kind of landing page that they can go into. And so there's a couple of things I wanted to draw your attention here um, on this page too. So the first is that I can post an announcement just to this group. So if I have a course project going on and I'm just wanting to communicate with them, I can do that in here um, and make that really um, customized. Another thing that you can see are some of the, the tools that I have and that students would have access to. So I can create um, content pages that are just for this group to be able to work with. Um, they can have other discussions that allow them to communicate with each other. I can give them exclusive access to certain files. Um, and then they have the conference and collaboration feature which is nice. Um, I don't presently use any of these options, but um, I hope to soon. The last thing here is uh, the feature that allows me to switch between groups really easily. So instead of having to go um, into each group or into each discussion, I can just move straight from um, one group to the next and go right to that discussion so that I can participate in it. 
Um, setting up a group is incredibly simple. You really have two options. Um, and so the first is when you are in your Canvas course and you're looking at your left hand menu, um, there is the people area where you can see your list of students. Um, and there's a tab up at the top that says groups. And if you click on that, there's not going to be anything um, except for a blue button that allows you to create groups. When you click on that group, uh, that blue group set button, this is what comes up. Um, so you would just decide on what your group name is going to be. Um, I always start off with discussion group and then it will go in and give it numbers. So discussion group one, discussion group two. Uh, and then when we reset and do new groups at four weeks, I do um, fancy new group. <laughs> so they all get those names. Um, you could allow uh, students to sign up for certain groups. Um, I do a random assignment. I just choose how many groups I'm going to have and I at the four week mark I reassess and see if I need to maybe create some bigger groups or smaller groups based on the types of discussions that have been happening. Um, if you're teaching multiple sections of that course um, and it's all tied together in your Canvas shell, uh, you can require that group members have to be in the same section. Um, I teach a cross-listed course in sociology and psychology, so those are both um, sections in my one Canvas course. And I could make it so that just the sociology students um, are grouped together and just the psychology students are grouped together. So that's kind of a neat function. Um, you can create groups yourself instead of letting Canvas do it. And you can also assign a leader, which has a lot of promising possibilities. Um, in I've played a little bit, the, the sociologist in me, um, in just randomly assigning leaders and not really saying too much about it to see if having that role um, brings out <laughs> the best in, in students who are um, randomly assigned that. And, uh, and it's been kind of fun to watch. It does seem to kind of get people a little bit more aware and involved. Um, so that's one way to create a group set. Another way to create it is when you're actually um, in doing your discussion assignment, if you're either creating it or you're editing a, an existing discussion assignment. And what that looks like um, is here's your screen where you're actually editing this and there's just this one little button that you click down here and it says this is a group discussion. So if you click that button, um, it's going to prompt you with this screen. Um, and this should look pretty familiar, right? So you're just putting in that group name, choosing how it's going to be set up um, and what the structure is, and then saving it. You'll notice here that it doesn't give you an option to do the leader, but there's another way to do that. I'll show that to you in just a second. So that's familiar, same process. Um, or you have, uh, if you've already created group sets, when you are doing this through the discussion assignment, then this would be what would pop up. Um, and so it just allows you to choose from the group sets that you've already created, uh, and then you save that and it's done. And there's nothing else that you need to do. So it really does take two seconds to set up a group discussion and then it automatically puts students into it. Um, and then they are where they need to be. Uh, for managing the groups, there's a couple of different functionalities here for you. So here I am in the people tab um, and you can see up at the top, I have my list of everyone and then I have my discussion groups and my fancy new groups. So those are my two group sets. Um, and so it appears this way you can collapse them um, and actually look at who is in each group. Um, at the start of the semester, I open all of these, I print it out and then I have a nice sheet that shows me which student is in what group. Um, and that's a, an easy way for me to kind of keep tabs on who I'm um, commenting on with each of my discussions. You have uh, the settings of each group that are available in that drop down with your little settings icon. Um, you have a settings icon for each individual student. I'll show you what those options look like here in just a moment. There's not a lot of things that you're going to do here, um, but there are a few things that you can do. Um, and then you have your little um, dots. And what that indicates is that you can move students from one group to the next just by clicking on those dots and dragging the student into another group. Um, and so it makes reassigning group members really, really easy. And also when I have new students who are coming in maybe with an ad code and weren't there when I originally assigned groups, it gives them the opportunity to, to just drag them into a group from that unassigned area that you see over on the left. 
Um, so if we look at that drop down menu from the student perspective, you can go in and you can remove a student from the group that would put them in the unassigned category. Or this is the other place where you can set them as a leader. Um, and if you weren't feeling the drag and drop, you could also um, select to move them from this particular menu. So really simple options, really easy to work within. Um, I always look at the unassigned students, um, you know, for the first week or two as students are enrolling and drag them. And then as students are not participating, I actually will go through and pull them out of the groups. Um, and I'll go through one week to see if, um, if they try to participate because it'll put them into the general um, discussion instead of into a group discussion so I can follow up with them and make sure that they're doing what they need to. Um, but it's really, really simple to put this all together. Um, and it's really helped me keep my discussions much more manageable. So I'm happy to take whatever questions you have. We do have one question, Summer, and it okay. is, does each discussion group get a different topic to discuss or can all the groups have the same question? It defaults to set you up with all the same questions. So when I create that discussion assignment, um, you know, everybody gets the exact same thing, uh, but you can go in and create separate discussions for each of the groups if that's what you want to do. Uh, we have another question. Have you ever had a group submit an outcome where they have to agree on something to submit. In other words, they would submit it as a group with perhaps the leader submitting it. I have, I have not played with that in Canvas, but that has been a function in, in my classes. Um, and I imagine that in Canvas, it probably would be a little bit easier to do because you have that group page that you can work with um, and it makes it a little bit easier to communicate with them. And I've played around with that feature a little bit in Canvas, and you can designate one person to submit for the group. Um, and one nice option there is you can choose to have one grade for everybody in the group, or you can choose to do individual grades for individual group members on an assignment by assignment basis. Uh, another question is um, group size. Have you found that smaller groups are better for getting everyone involved? Is there a, a sweet spot, an ideal number that you found? I really am finding that it makes a big difference in the discussions. They're making them much more meaningful um, because people are starting to catch on to, hey, you know, these are my, these are my six people or my eight people. Um, and so they're communicating and, and week over week, I'm seeing themes kind of pop up and shared stories. Oh, this reminds me of last time that I wasn't seeing when we were just having 45 person discussions. <laughs> so um, I have been splitting up my classes um, into groups of six or seven to start with. And then I make adjustments as I need to. Um, if I'm finding that one group isn't um, very participatory, I'll pull them all apart and put them into groups where I am seeing better participation. Um, but I try to keep each group with about six students, six to eight. Okay, great. And I think we have time for one more question about discussions. Um, okay, I'm going to put two questions into one. Uh, the first part, how often do students participate in your discussions and do they ever get together outside of um, your Canvas discussions? Okay, so first question, um, I have them in um, most of my courses, they're either doing this weekly um, for the first seven weeks or they're doing it weekly for all eight weeks, but it is a part of our, our weekly structure. Um, and the second question with regards to um, interacting outside of the discussion, I don't have anything that requires them to do so, um, but I have seen some indications that students are um, trying to continue to communicate even when I switch them into a new group um, and they're kind of referencing each other. So I, I am seeing some connections in that way. Yeah. Well, that to me says that the discussion groups are really working as a, almost like a study group where they they can support each other and they're comfortable working together and and maybe they'll be more comfortable working with these people when they see them in future classes too because you know as sociology or psychology majors they may well end up in online classes together again right and we're delving into some pretty controversial issues sometimes and um, I, I'm seeing a lot of group identity that's forming within that and I've played with changing the groups every two weeks every three weeks um, not changing them at all just to see what is the the right amount and I'm really finding that that four weeks has been really positive for getting them to um, to connect with each other so thank you so much summer
So we're going to turn things over to Chris Hayashi from the psychology department, and they have been doing some really innovative things with Canvas and also with OER. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris to let him explain. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is uh, Christopher Hayashi. I'm a professor of psychology. I've been at Southwestern College since 2004, and I've been serving as the department chair for the Department of Behavioral Sciences uh, for the last six or seven years. Uh, so my inspiration for creating this uh, Psych 101 course was to create a department standard course uh, that people could build uh, off of going forward. And the reason I did that is because I noticed in some of our online courses that student outcomes is in terms of retention and, and success varied anywhere between 30% to 100%, which was kind of interesting. So I um, wanted to see if there was something that perhaps uh, we could do about that. I thought the online venue might be a good opportunity, especially since we were transitioning to Canvas. Uh, so that being said, I will take you uh, through a little tour of this course, which is built upon um, the OpenStax OER. So here's the homepage, just a little introduction about myself and the course. Uh, and then as you can see, uh, there's a kind of a course map here and a little introduction about how this course is built upon the free open online textbook by OpenStax and Rice University. I provide a link to the textbook site uh, that also provides some opportunities to purchase the textbook at a very more affordable cost, both a hardback edition, as well as uh, Kindle versions and um, anything else for your portable device. Uh, then we have a kind of a, a, a course map that's broken up in two weeks. So pretty much one chapter per week from our textbook. And uh, I have it broken into content dissemination. So this is where students get the kind of the course content. Uh, I haven't implemented any knowledge checks yet, but, and then we also have the different types of assessments that the students complete each week as well. So I'll just take you into a module to see for you so you can get an idea of how um, the OpenStax is integrated into the course. So I chose the topic of uh, personality. So introduction to week one here. All right, so the it, link takes you to the first page of the module and just provides a little overview. Uh, I usually give a little short description. This one's very short. I probably need to build upon this uh, a bit more. And then I take the kind of more general core objective for this chapter, and this is actually a verbiage straight from our course outline. Uh, participants will be able to, and then to meet these objectives, these are the things that the students will actually do. So that's the first page. Uh, the second page takes them to some video tutorials that I have chosen. These are from Crash Course, and the nice thing about Crash Course is that they are um, pretty well integrated into the OpenStax. I'm, I'm not convinced, but I'm pretty sure they consulted with OpenStax in terms of building the content for these videos. Uh, and then I, they're also all closed caption, so uh, compliant, ADA compliant. And uh, I also have screened them to see which of the specific chapter learning objectives that they address. So I provide a little short intro. In addition to the assigned reading, this video tutorial will help you to address the following learning objectives for the chapters. I encourage them to take notes on the learning objectives uh, as they view the videos and read the textbook. I've screened these videos, as I mentioned, to make sure that they do touch upon those uh, specific learning objectives. So here's another video tutorial from Crash Course as well. And uh, here's some learning objectives that weren't necessarily touched upon by Crash Course video tutorials. So I let the students know that they need to consult their textbooks for those. Oops. All right, and so this is how the textbook uh, is integrated into the course. You can just copy and paste the uh, URL and it, it nicely and neatly in, embeds it into the Canvas site. Uh, so here's the introductory page for the chapter on personality. 
So students can either navigate uh, the chapter in the Canvas site themselves, or they can link out to the external site, which provides a little larger screen. So this just gives you an idea of what the OpenStax uh, textbook looks like. And once again, this is com completely free online. So, you know, we're saving students a, a lot of money, which is a great thing. Uh, so it's very comparable to any textbook that costs 100 and over $200 that you would find in the bookstore. Well, it's also nice that they have in the OpenStax textbook some kind of embedded, embedded video to, to uh, relevant content, uh, a summary, as well as some review questions uh, for the students. So this just gives you an idea of what the textbook looks like. Uh, and then next, I have some more kind of um, rigorous assessments. Uh, I have a reflecting on your learning. So I have students uh, that answer a few questions. What's the most interesting thing that you learned from watching the video tutorials? What's the most interesting, interesting thing that you uh, learned from reading the chapter? Uh, as well as then I have them pick a specific learning objective from the chapter or two of them and I write out the answer and then I have a, a rubric that makes it uh, relatively easy to grade here. Uh, then we have a, a chapter quiz and, quiz, and I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that uh, the assessments or the assignments that students do are all uh, linked to specific student learning outcomes. So we have two specific student learning outcomes that we're assessing uh, at the moment in our program. This one is students will be able to use scientific reasoning and knowledge base in psychology to interpret psychological phenomenon. So this is our thinking and reasoning. The one on the previous screen uh, has to do with communication skills. Uh, I thought I had a learning object or SLO there, but I guess we don't. And the final assignment here is kind of a video application. So again, this one is linked to the student learning outcome for communication skills. Students will describe and apply major concepts and theories of psychology and writing and or in other forms of effective presentation. So I have students basically choose a video that I, I have pre-screened, uh, summarize the video and tell them, tell us how it applies to their life. Uh, and so the videos are here embedded as well. And there's a rubric for the video applications. And then last but not least, I have a discussion board uh, that also assesses the same SLO, communication skills. Students will describe and apply major concepts of psychology. And same kind of idea. I have them pick a term theory that they found interesting, summarize, and basically tell us how it applies to their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the purpose of the, these assignments was to not only have some kind of agreed upon rigor and standards, for what students should do, but also for what our instructors are accountable for uh, grading and using for regular effective contact as well. So hopefully that gives you a little idea of what this course looks like uh, built upon a completely free OpenStax you know, textbook. Uh, and th this course is open for all faculty in my program to take and uh, modify. This was intended for to be a collaborative effort so that we can, you know, as a community build upon it going forward. Full disclaimer, I'm currently not teaching this course this semester, so I built the whole thing and, and, and I'm not che teaching it, but I will be next semester. So I'm excited to uh, work with the faculty that are currently teaching it and, and see where we can go with this. So that's all from me. I hope that's helpful. That is super helpful, Chris. Uh, I'm going to show everybody um, what it looks like out in the comments in just a second. But we did have um, one question, which was, is this your only textbook? Have you found this to be a complete enough textbook that students don't need to purchase anything in addition to it? Absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, the nice thing about Psych 101 is it's, it's, it's pretty standard in terms of the course content. Uh, from textbooks to textbook to textbook, there's probably 30, 40, 50 textbooks out there. And this one is pretty comparable. So um, for this particular course, yeah, don't really require students to purchase anything outside of it. But some instructors are having some supplemental reading, which we, of course, we encourage. So. 
Um, a related question is, is OpenStax essentially an, uh, an online publishing house? Could you talk a little bit about OpenStax? Yeah, as far as I know, I think, and Tracy, you might know better than me, I believe it was a project funded by the uh, Bill Gates Lumina Foundation. And so they gave money to Rice University. And so it's developed by the faculty at Rice University. Uh, and our, uh, our system, the California Community Colleges, um, have been funding OER development um, and adoption in our colleges as well. So um, there was an initial round to um, develop and or select OER textbooks. Um, and then right now, a lot of, of our colleagues at other colleges are working on Z degrees, which are zero textbook cost degrees. So students can actually go through their entire major path and not have to purchase a textbook. Uh, and Angela um, in the chat is saying that OpenStax has online material for math, science, social science, humanities, um, and there are um, a variety of disciplines and they're increasing every day, but they don't have everything. Um, a lot of the titles that they started with were some of the ones that are most expensive for students and um, new ones are being added all the time. So I have a couple of things that I will um, share with you. Okay, so let me do a little screen sharing then just to show you where some of this is. Um, Chris, if you don't mind, I'm gonna stop your screen share. Um, start mine and take you out to the Canvas Commons. So from your global navigation menu in Canvas, everybody has a Commons link. You'll still be logged into Canvas, but it takes you to the Canvas Commons where faculty can share information and materials with each other. And so we, um, by default, are connected here to all Canvas instructors everywhere. But as the person doing the sharing, Chris or me or you, can choose how widely we want to share something. So we can choose to share with all Canvas users. We can choose to share with um, the California Community Colleges. Southwestern College, or we can create custom share groups, which is what psychology has done, biology, communication studies, and a few others. And so they will be sharing this with just the instructors who will find it relevant. And so um, that's what has um, been done with the course that we were just looking at. There's a share group um, and the department maintains who has access to it. And feel free to contact me if you'd like to set one up for your department or even just for instructors teaching a particular course. Um, so that's the Canvas Commons. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you, kind of building on the question that we just had, Cool for Ed is a website that is maintained by all three of our higher education systems in California. So UC, CSU, and the CCCs all united to create this website that provides some showcases, information about those grants that are coming out uh, at the system level for faculty, um, and a variety of ways to help you find OER textbooks. OpenStax is probably the biggest provider, but there are some others as well. And speaking of content, we had another question wanting to know if you created um, your own content, um, the questions, finding the videos. Yes, it took a considerable amount of time to build this course, uh, to screen all of the videos, to figure out what was in the videos and how they overlapped with the uh, content in the chapters. Uh, so that took a lot of time. Um, I had, you know, of course, a lot of the material I had brought over for Blackboard, but uh, not all of it. Um, one of the things that I really liked in your class, Chris, was that uh, the video applications asked students to apply what they had learned to, sit to their own situations, their own lives, or things that they'd experienced. And it seems like that is going to also let the students create content for the course, because they're bringing in examples that are not from the textbook, but from their own experiences. Right. What I would like to do is, again, for more to create some more instructor created content is kind of provide a little introduction for each topic. So for example, in this chapter, this applies to me in this way. So the students can get a little window into who I am and you know how this relates to my experiences as well. So uh, that's one area of the course that I would like to uh, beef up. And I recommend you do that in video with a drone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think was it was Michaela. I think her golf swings better than mine. So I, I think I'll <laughs> stick with the text. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our SWC Spotlight. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you very much to Michaela, Summer, and Chris for sharing the amazing work you're doing with our students. Have a great rest of the semester, everybody, and we'll see you in the spring for another round of webinars.